Folks, welcome to the final session. We've made it. We've made it through these last two days with this this new platform, conference platform, Spot Me, which is broadly hung in there. We've gone through ups and downs of been talking about the difficulties and even the delusions of net zero. And we've had lots and lots of sessions. Um, increasingly today, I think today, yesterday was quite depressing, and today has been really quite uplifting. I think so. Hopefully, you found that too. And, and it's an absolute pleasure then to introduce um, our speaker for the final session, and that speaker is Dr. Matt Winning. Um, Matt is an environmental economist at, at UCL, um, who by day uh, he, he is a he works particularly around the, the economics of climate change and things like carbon capture storage and things like that. But by night he performs live climate change comedy. He hosts a, a podcast called Operation Earth, and uh, and another podcast which I've been enjoying. It's been in recently is something called Up Your Footfall, which is uh, nothing to do with climate change at all, but actually very funny. It's about a supermarket, or anyway, I'll let you find it yourself. And he's also got a TEDx talk on the importance of using humour to uh, discuss climate change, and that's the context in which we've asked Matt to round us off, really, because we started off with uh, the kind of sobering uh, aspects uh, from, from people like um, Kevin Anderson, uh, which might have got us all depressed, but we wanted to finish on a high and, you know, what better way through humor and pressure. Re and so Matt's the pressure release button that we're going to press to close the conference. And um, so it's an absolute pleasure to invite Matt up and ask Matt to take us away and cheer the hell, cheer us up. Are we good? You're good to go. I'm going to take myself off. Great. Uh, I can't see anybody, so I'm going to need somebody to say yes. Or, or um, you can see that. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. All good. Fantastic. Well, lovely to be here um, on a Friday afternoon to round things off. Um, I caught a little bit earlier on today, um, which was which was great. I kind of dipped in and out a little bit. Um, but yeah, uh, lovely to be here. My name is uh, Dr. Matt Winning. Uh, which is uh, the most, uh, you know, upbeat name in comedy today, uh, winning by name. <laughs> That's about it. Um, I did uh, ask, we had a, a, a child last year, a son. I did ask if he could be called um, Oscar, uh, but my wife uh, absolutely vetoed that one. Um, so I'm here today. I, uh, I'm going to do a quick 20 minutes of comedy and then we'll hopefully I think we'll have a Q&A and, and discuss uh, how we communicate. I think um, climate change in different ways of communicating because if we can make this funny, you know, then surely we can solve the problem. Um, the show is called "It's the End." Well, the show that what I did have was called "It's the End of the World as We Know It," um, which is obviously named after the the REM song. I'm sure most of you will be aware. Um, I did want to call it "It's the End of the World as We Know It," brackets, and I feel fine. Brackets. Only joking. I'm a climate change researcher. I live in a constant state of existential dread. In fact, I feel a bit like, um, you know, uh, Sarah Connor in the Terminator films uh, when she, you know, she knows Judgment Day is coming, right? And every, she's like looking at everybody just acting normal and she's like, why aren't you doing anything about it? Close brackets. Um, anyway, too long that was apparently the, the title. Show. So I am a comedian uh, as well as a, an environmental researcher, uh, but just so you've got an idea of the sort of comedian that you're watching today, uh, I'm the sort of comedian that's followed on Twitter by the European Corrugated Board Industry. Mm -hmm. Cardboard, that is my target demographic. Worst part about this, they have a thousand more followers than me on Twitter. Um, and when I found that out, I wanted to walk directly into the sea. Uh, which will become increasingly easy over the coming decades. So uh, there's always upsides, isn't there? Um, don't follow them back, though. So who's the real winner here? Nobody. OK, next slide. So um, I'm an academic, uh, obviously. So what I like to do is I like to tell you what I'm about to tell you. And then afterwards, you know, I spend 20 minutes telling you. And then afterwards, uh, I tell you that I told you what I was going to tell you. Uh, or uh, as the young people nowadays they call it, spoilers. But here are... We are going to cover um, this afternoon um, these three questions. They're important questions, and they're the same three questions that you will be asked at any job interview for a bureau de change. 
Must we change? Can we change? And will we change? So let's get on with things. Let's make a start. So 2016 was the warmest year on record, although jointly sort of somewhere. Um, I was, uh, it's my, my pin number 2016, also my pin number. I always change my pin number to the warmest year on record. Um, uh, does it make me more susceptible to fraud? Absolutely. Uh, but the message is getting out there, and that's the important thing. Um, uh, and we've been warming the planet. Uh, the, 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 the war 2017 was the warmest non-El Nino year on record. Um, if you don't know, uh, El Nino are a five-piece Italian a cappella band. Um, I had tickets to them at the O2, but um, obviously with COVID. Um, and what has been causing that warming? Well, it's mostly about, you know, 85% of it's been through a burning of uh, fossil fuels, such as coal, gas and oil, uh, which was the original name of the band Earth, Wind and Fire. Not a lot of people know that. Um, yes, that's uh, what was causing it. And you can see that it's basically just skyrocketed since the middle of the century. Um, there have been a few dips. Obviously, this last year, there's been a massive dip. It's not on this chart. Uh, but there was a massive uh, dip uh, with uh, COVID. Uh, you can see a dip there um, with the recession in 2009. And in the mid-70s, uh, there was a big uh, dip because of disco. Uh, too busy burning down the dance floors back then. Um, and we are causing climate change is the other thing that I like to tell uh, people. Um, actually, all of the other natural factors uh, that can influence uh, the climate, um, the better best estimate is that um, it would have slightly cooled the planet over the last 150 years. So humans are causing about 110% of all the warming. People say you can't give 110%. It turns out you can and stop doing it. Um, so, uh, and we're having to deal with this when you also have at the same time people in the media and on uh, social media, putting out misinformation, for instance, uh, quite a famous, I'm sure some people will be aware, uh, climate denier uh, who said that, uh, you know, it's not an existential threat uh, because uh, for comparison, the atmosphere of Venus is 96.5% CO2 and the planet's still there. I mean, I think we can uh, aim a bit higher than something just being there as where we want to live, you know? Like Wolverhampton is there. I'm not moving there anytime soon. Uh, although I'm pretty sure if we did move to Venus, my grandmother would keep the heating on uh, at all times still. So what are the impacts of climate change going to be? Well, I think we can all see from this uh, famous chart uh, that uh, the planet is going to get squashed and go sort of weird colours. Um, and there's going to be uh, six of them. So, you know, you can choose whichever one you want. Um, no, changes in surface temperature, precipitation, sea level, rises. Those are the things that are happening. Uh, basically, you know, it's going to be very difficult in the future to do your exams underwater. You're going to have scuba masks on, puffer fish going by your head. On the upside, though, uh, squid nearby, free ink refills for your pens. Um, no, basically, the future uh, is going to be pretty difficult. So droughts is one thing that we, uh, I mentioned there, but it's not just going to be, you know, we, we assume that droughts um, are just uh, elsewhere. It's, it's already, you know, um, affecting us here. Uh, the Environment Agency recently said uh, England could run short of water within the next 25 years and cause uh, called for uh, water use to uh, be cut by a third. Uh, and the head of the Environment Agency, Sir James Bevan, also, I don't know if you see the top sentence, said that he wants water uh, wasting to become as socially unacceptable as blowing smoke in the face of a baby. Um, and my worry about that, um, I mean, first of all, very specific I mean, the guy's clearly grown up somewhere uh, tough going. Um, but my point is that my worry, is, you know, is that you English people are probably just going to try and get around that fact by making it more socially acceptable to blow smoke in the face of... A... Anyway, uh, you get my point. And that's obviously affect food production. That's one of the massive uh, aspects of that. Um, now, uh, it's not just food production um, elsewhere, it's also here in the UK. Because of the, um, uh, the heat wave that we had in the summer of 2018, um, it meant that over the following year in the UK, our chips shrank by an inch. 
Now, that is not a world I want to live in. You know, one of life's only joys that I have left in life is when you've got a bag of chips and you find a really big chip in it and you, like, pull it out for the rest of the room. Like the sword and the stone, you hold it all off and you're like, guys, look at this chip. And somebody else is like, oh, yes, it must have eaten all the other chips. And you're like, hey. your children won't have that. And what I'm saying, you know, there's difficult choices to be made. You know, you can have big chips, but you're going to need to stop flying to Magaluf to sleep with someone from Middlesbrough when you could just go to Middlesbrough and do it. You know, the solutions are there, people. So um, that's... Uh, Droughts and food production. Um, we've also got melting uh, glaciers, um, which provide three quarters of, of the world's uh, water. Uh, plus, we might uh, run out of, of mint. And also the ice caps. Now, the ice caps are obviously incredibly important because they um, actually let me check my watch. Uh, they uh, keep the planet cool. Uh, you know, the, the albedo effect basically means that. Um, similar to how in lots of uh, warmer countries all the houses are white, uh, that's the same thing with the earth. Having uh, the, the reflection of, 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 of the sunlight um, means that uh, it keeps the planet cool. So as, as the uh, ice melts and, and goes away, not only does it raise sea levels, but it also uh, heats the planet more uh, exponentially warmer. Um, uh, and a sort of runaway snowball effect. I mean, snowball is a poor choice of words there, but you get the point. Now, Basically, what I'm saying is the future is going to be like the film Waterworld. Terrible. Like, really bad and expensive. Um, and Kevin Costner is going to still be alive. So, um, oh, I've skipped to the next one. I've made a mistake. Um, basically, what I was going to say is you probably don't think you know a huge amount about sea level rise unless we've got people in the audience who are literally working on sea level rise. But... Uh, I bet a lot of you do. I bet a lot of you remember um, a, a, a paper um, that came out, uh, you know, a really remarkable paper that came out in the early 2000s by this uh, young group of authors uh, about what the sea level rise would be in the year 3000. Um, and I, just in case any of you are a bit older and you don't remember, they stated that uh, I've been to the year 3000. Not much has changed, but we lived underwater. And your great, great, great granddaughter is pretty fine. Now, I mean, first of all, busted we're talking about climate change back in the early 2000s. They should have been given the Nobel Peace Prize before the IPCC or any of that stuff. These guys were ahead of the curve. The only reason that, I, you know, that I, I wasn't even thinking about climate change back then. All I was thinking about in the early 2000s was getting good grades in my exams at school. Um, not because I wanted like a good job or anything necessarily, uh, but because if I did get good grades, uh, my parents were going to let me and my friend Colin uh, go to Magaluf for the summer. Uh, and I did. I got I got the grades uh, and I met someone very nice from Middlesbrough. Anyway, um, point is, now that I've got a PhD, I'm able to sort of peer review their um, study. Now, they didn't, my, my, my issue is with, well, they didn't uh, specify what assumptions they were making about emissions trends out to the year 3000. Um, so I had a quick look, you know, at what that might mean. Under a two degree warming world, we're expecting uh, central London without any extra infrastructure for um, flood prevention to be partially underwater. And that's a two degree world. You know, that's the best we can hope for. We're going to have to do a lot, you can see there. Uh, and under a four degree world, um, even higher, there's going to be, you know, sharks in the House of Commons. Uh, so I guess not much has changed. They were, they were right. Um, and this is the same... Uh, uh, two degrees under uh, in New York, a bit more of a stark example. This one, um, you can see there's some flooding at the back there. This is um, obviously what Wall Street. Um, uh, you can see the bull, um, and that's a two degree world, um, and then a four degree world. Now, according to Busted, they're still under there taking selfies. Everything's fine. What I'm saying is, I think Busted's assumptions about our adaptation to climate change were a tad optimistic. Um, I'd also say that uh, their uh, life expectancy assumptions were also uh, a tad optimistic because uh, I calculated what age my great, great, great granddaughter would be in the year 3000. And she would probably be 786 years old. Uh, so I don't think she is fine. OK. The cities at risk from sea level rise in 2070 um, by population. So pretty massive. So must we change? 
Uh, I think the answer is clearly we must. Uh, we, we change. Um, now, uh, very quickly, I, so trying to communicate this and talk to people. Um, I, I recently um, was trying to talk to my mum about climate change and tell her uh, about celebrities that were interested in it. Uh, I told her, like, this is Leonardo uh, DiCaprio, who's, um, she, she knows very well. Uh, he's into climate change. He, um, made a film before the flood, he's got his own foundation. And the reason that Leo hates climate change is because uh, the only reason he got famous in the first place was due to an iceberg. Uh, so he's been trying to protect those. And that's him next to my hero, uh, my absolute favourite UN Secretary General of all time, Ban Ki-moon. Uh, and this is a picture of me at Warrington Bank Key uh, with a cardboard cutout of a, a moon. Yep. My Warrington Bank Key Moon. My wife said, I'm not getting off the train to take that picture. Um, it's not going to be worth it. Well, I think we can all see from the reaction. I mean, I can't hear anybody. Um, let's skip through some stuff. Um, I, I mean, I just don't have time to talk about this. Uh, <laughs> just going to get through some stuff on tra so transport. Obviously, it's a big one. Um, in the UK, it was the largest emitting sector, um, although I think it did briefly dropped due, due to COVID, but I imagine it's back up now. Um, flying's a massive one. Um, one thing, so I've got an idea, obviously flying, we don't have the uh, technological shift. We, you know, the, we can't just switch to electric planes and stuff like that in the short term. So demand reduction is, is incredibly important, uh, or at least not having much in the way of, of demand increase, reducing the increase. Um, so my uh, solution for this is that, Right, some people are afraid of flying. I think we just need to make more people afraid of flying. I'm thinking, right, glass floors on planes, right? The only in-flight entertainment is uh, the film Alive. Actual snakes on a plane, right? Uh, and babies crying the entire time. How are we getting them to cry? Or bone smoke in their faces. Done. Bingo. Um, I've tried to cut down flying. I'm sure many people have talked about this. Um, I uh, haven't flown for three and a bit years now, um, but I, I, I try to take the train. I prefer taking the train. I find um, taking the train much more enjoyable because uh, I feel like when you get on a flight, it's very patronising. You know, it's like um, you get all your train meals served at the same time and they're like, they think you're an idiot, don't they? Because they're like, well, this is how you put on a, a belt, isn't it? Yes. And this, what's this? This is a whistle. Whereas on a train, you get on and they just go, there's a window, there's an axe, work it out. That's how I like to travel. Bit of danger. Uh, road transport's obviously um, a massive uh, uh, difference. Um, it changed with electric vehicles coming in now. Um, the next Transformers film is apparently going to be three hours of uh, Optimus Prime just recharging himself, though. Um, hopefully they can bring that down um, a bit quicker. Um, I think uh, time-wise, I'm just going to give you another couple of minutes, uh, but uh, I'll not go too far. Agriculture, oh, I forgot it does that. Really, that's horrible. Um, we, um, agriculture is obviously a difficult one. Increasing food production with increasing population is difficult as well. Um, I was told that we were, uh, this chart uh, on the left shows that we um, need to produce as much food between the year 2000 and 2050 as has ever been produced in the history of mankind. Um, and um, I'm not going to sugarcoat that fact for you because it would require further deforestation uh, to grow the sugar cane. But we're doing that and, you know, we're trying to do that while climate change is impacting our, our, our food production. For instance, the guy in the bottom uh, corner there, um, because of climate change, his hands have grown so big, he, um, he can't eat corn on the cob anymore. And it's his favourite uh, food. That's my favourite joke. So uh, quite embarrassing for basically people. Stop drinking almond milk. It's meant for baby almonds. Um, embarrassing for them coming out with the same earrings on. Um, I've changed uh, to oat milk. The main thing that I drink now is oat milk, obviously, as an individual, uh, which um, is weird when I have it on porridge because I'm, I feel like the most Scottish man in the entire world. Like I can't get enough oats and I'm asking someone to ground down some more oats so that I can pour them in my oats. It's weird. Um, but yes, dairy, I've cut down meat uh, uh, as well. Um, and it's been difficult. You know, I've cut meat down to maybe once a month now. Um, and I enjoy a, a burger as much as the next five guys. 
Um, electricity and heat is a massive one. Um, there's, been, there's been good news, obviously, with electricity. Um, for instance, last year, Scotland was generating enough, uh, two years ago, actually, Scotland was, oh, it's happened again, hasn't it? Generating enough uh, from wind power to Scotland. Um, and nobody needs two Scotlands, do they? I mean, what are we going to do? We, it's one of them, like the good Scotland that we bring out when we've got guests coming around. Plus, you know, is that going to take off as a unit of measurement? How much is this light bulb? Uh, I think it's a millionth of a Scotland. Anyway, um, and then we've got other stuff, industry and buildings and uh, obviously uh, other energy. I don't know what that is. I presume it's like showing my parents how to use their uh, iPads, things that take up all of my other energy. Um, I'm going to leave it there. There's more I could definitely go on and do. In fact, I'll, very, I'll skip right to the end here. Here we go. Right. Skip through this. There's all the stuff. Um, one thing that I've been doing uh, from these shows that I've been doing is putting um, a renewable energy provider, uh, a link to my, um, I don't even think I've got it here, but I've been putting that in. Um, this is an old one, uh, but basically I've been keeping track of people that have come to see the show that I've done um, to see um, how many people have changed energy provider after seeing me, just as a way of seeing whether you know influences people or, or not. Um, and it's actually up to something like, if this is an old one, I'm very sorry about that, but it's up to something like 52 tonnes uh, or something a year, assuming that people stay and other things. This isn't an academic thing, but, um, but you know, our average uh, emissions in the UK are something like seven um, tonnes of CO2 equivalent a year for greenhouse gases. Um, so, you know, just me going out and talking about that is uh, affecting people out with my own carbon footprint. I'm able to actually affect other people by by talking about it, which I think is a nice uh, thing to end on. So I am going to stop there uh, and hopefully somebody can bring me off the screen and we can take some questions. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. After that, we, um, we've actually got 523, it's probably going to rock it up now, claps, which I think is probably the same amount of claps as the whole the entire conference. <laughs> but it must be weird doing comedy, especially in this one, where you just can't see people. I mean, it's Nah, it's, it's weird. It feels like doing television or something like that, where you're just performing to a, a wee tiny screen. But I've been doing it during COVID for the last year and a bit, so I'm sort of used to it enough. Hopefully it was okay, guys. I, I mean, I apologise if I was uh, not in shot or anything like that. Well, I, want to, I think people will be interested. I wanted to ask a couple of things, really. Um, and one of them was, I, I mean, I know a little bit about how you get into it, but other people don't. Maybe worthwhile talking because you've got these two completely different worlds, and I wondered yeah. if one if comedy was a reaction to the to the to the, the, the academic world. Is that an escape? It was it initially. Basically, I came kind of full circle. I started doing comedy during my PhD as a way to stop thinking about my PhD, and then I went away and did comedy for about seven or eight years, not about climate change, and then eventually came back and went maybe i should try and write a show about climate change but nobody's gonna it's not funny it's gonna be too difficult but i was like i'll just go out in a blaze of glory i'll try this see if it works if it doesn't work fine i've given it a shot and um, but i found just a remarkable amount of of positive things about doing comedy about it um i guess i didn't really have time to think about before i did the show just in terms of you know, from a, being a, the messenger of, of, of the thing, you, you bring yourself down an awful lot by being uh, funny and being self-deprecating and you're able to communicate, I think, to a much wider audience and get people to listen to you more because, okay, I have the expertise, but uh, also, you know, I'm kind of I'm one of you, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm just, just a guy. <laughs> and, and I think there's a, you know, there's a there's sort of expectation of, of being an academic and, and communicating that comedy can help navigate around that a little bit. So just on um, that point, then, I mean, not every, you know, I'm sure there's lots of early career researchers, maybe medium and senior career researchers that are, that they're not going to necessarily go out and do stand up because they'll just compete with you. So they're not going to do that. But <laughs> what, what would you say are maybe some of the take homes that they could be doing? To be a little bit more effective in their say public communications yes so i mean this this is there's two things you can bring comedy into that but i'd say first and foremost you should it's, it's good for everybody's mental health to have a hobby or have something else that's outside their work i've now made the problem that i had a hobby and now it's been taken over by climate change <laughs> uh, as well um but um Doing other things, getting good at other things, and then bringing climate change into that is is one route. 
that I would recommend. So whatever it is that you're good at, whatever it is you individually make you different, makes you excel. There's all, you know, climate change is, you'll think it might not be part of that, but it, there's, there'll be some way where you can bring it to knitting or you can bring it to whatever it is you do. Um, but at the same time, you know, uh, I think trying to, um, th th there's, a, there's definitely a point about engagement here and it probably applies much wider than climate change, but, but I find that climate change is such a negative subject that comedy can help uh, mm. balance that out a little bit. You know, I feel like a lot of other art forms will struggle with that. If you, I've seen plays about climate change and it just depresses me a lot of the time because I'm like, well, I'm not, it's already, yeah. I feel like a weight on my shoulders. So hopefully, you know, I feel like comedy can sort of at least give us a break. It can help us as people that work in this area to cope with it. But I think more importantly, it can help people to become engaged, you know, bring it's, it's bringing it to people where they already are. So they want something entertaining. They want to be entertained. Make it entertaining first and foremost. Whatever it is you do, try and add some spontaneity into it as well. As what I, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people would um, would uh, understand why I did this, but um, <laughs> or appreciate it at least. The, one of the shows that I did, I um, pretended that I had a lot of academic marking to do at the same time as the show and wasn't getting through it. So I handed out what I pretended to be master's dissertations for an audience member to mark in the audience, but it was just instructions for them to ask questions during the show. So then they would ask questions and like put their hand up and say, oh, but do you mean that, you know, consumption instead of production emission? And it would get a laugh in the room because it was bringing people in and it was kind of playing with the way that we interact and expectations about being an academic and stuff. So, so be playful, I think is the other thing that I would say, because, um, you know, there, there, there's definitely, a, a, I say a market, I mean, it's a bad word, but there's people who will be affected by someone going, the world's, you know, this is coming to, you know, things are awful, we're going to struggle, things aren't going to change. But there's, a, I'd say there's a much larger percentage of people who would just shut down or be put off by that. How do you reach them? Are you, are you trying to not reach them? You know, so my thing is, I think you, I'd rather be reaching those harder to reach people um, by making it, bringing it to them rather than assuming that they have to become something different, you know, something different, environmentalist, which I don't think they do. But people are interested, people want to be informed, people want to be, you know, I, the main thing that I get is people saying, oh, that was, you know, I really enjoyed myself, but also I learned something. And mm -hmm. that's, that, that's it. That's all I can possibly hope for and what i really like about what, the way you work is because of course you use powerpoint and in many respects if, I, if you were just looking at the slides it could appear as a, a pretty normal uh, climate yes. change talk I mean, with those ipccs it's how we see them all the time and and i and often i think what's we, we obviously had you up one time looking at the early career mm. for communication and i think we get trained in being the expert and, and, and especially early career, it puts you narrower and narrower into this place as the, the specialist that yeah. disconnects you from everyone else. And and so actually, and the kind of thing, yeah. I was going to say exposing yourself, but that, that brings in a whole different dimension. <laughs> I mean, it's quite it, exposing. Is, yeah, no, I completely agree because the main thing you get trained in, I guess, is presenting to other academics. I'd be worried that, oh, well, we're presenting to a, perfect, you know, a professor, so we better look really smart we better make sure we know you know and we make it make it complicated it's the opposite i think of what early career re researchers should be doing which is they should be you know being trained to make it accessible yeah um that's so no, i completely great, agree great message to go i mean there was one there was one actually question in the chat you should have a look at the thread because there's loads of positive the thread. Someone oh, wow. said, how much co2 how much co2 does the average joke produce someone says then yeah uh, well, it depends whether it's online, written down in person, doesn't it? Yeah. I don't know. No. I mean, it depends when you think of it as well. It says, Wait, does comedy have a GHG impact? Can we recycle and reuse Matt's jokes? Well, well, you recycle and reuse your own jokes. I think everyone can oh, reuse yeah. that. Oh, yeah. You have to recycle and reuse them. Um, but I, I mean, just to finish. Sorry, here you go. No, no, no. I was just going to joke. Since it's well, well, it's your job. Um, so one of the things I was going to say is 
we, we, you mentioned something earlier before we came on, which I thought was quite important, because I mentioned we started off with Kevin Anderson and quite a very downbeat, sobering assessment, very much rooted in the science. And you kind of joked that you were the opposite spectrum. I mean, you are much more optimistic. So just oh, I kind of send me serious thing. But do you does the comedy feed into that, or do you are you just an optimistic about the future? I mean, um, I mean, I, I agree with a lot of what Kevin talk, talks about as well. You know, I, 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 I I'm optimistic that we will get there in the end. To be honest, I'm not even that. I wouldn't even say I'm that optimistic. I, I think we'll, you know, I think we'll do more than. Um, than half, shall we say? I think we'll get towards it, but we're humans. We're flawed. People are flawed. It's going to be difficult. It's going to be really difficult. Um, but I think you have to give people a balance. You have to. Pe people want to take an action. People want agency. And if all they hear is that things aren't happening and governments aren't taking action or whatever. It, it, we might be, and I, I presume I'm allowed to swear here. Um, we might, we might be fucked. But yeah. if you don't try, you know, what what's going to make people try as hard as they possibly can? So it's all about just doing what you can, what's in your yeah. sphere of influence, which can be larger. But all, all we can do in life is do what you know with it. Anything that's in within our own control, you can't be worrying about. You know, I think I'd, I'd apply this to everything across life. You can't worry about things that are out with your control um, too much because it's not going to get you anywhere. It's not going to achieve anything. All you can do is look back and say, "I tried my hardest to do this, and this yeah. is where we got to." Fantastic. Well, it's a much more hopeful, if not optimistic, hopeful way of looking at it than when we started. Um, Matt, it's been an absolute pleasure as ever. Thank you very, very much. And if, just have a look at some of the comments on the third of you. Everyone else has really appreciated it. And you're up to 788 claps now. So <laughs> take, take that on board. Nope. Have a great weekend. Pleasure being here. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, and So so if I just uh, close things up, it's, uh, it's been the last um, the last event, really, the last point in the uh, the conference. I... Um, it's just this, whenever, if you've ever organized one of these things, you'll know there's just a whole ton of people to, to thank. So please bear with me where I, I just want to mention um, some of the people who've been absolutely instrumental to getting this thing off the ground. First off, uh, all the backstage staff that's just kept this thing going, as I say, it's a new uh, platform we've tried with the University as we are the first with the guinea pigs for the university and broadly it's gone fantastic. So can I thank Catherine Reynolds, Kayleigh Young, Valentine, Shannon Heaney, uh, Sally Bishop Hawes, Alison Goodwin, Louise Hagen and Millie Archer on that side. And I'd also like to, to thank the Low Cabin Devon team. They've been kind of uh, wrangled and marshaled over the last few days and have been absolutely brilliant. So that's Paul Lunt, Claire Pierce, Hilly Holt, Becky Barnes, Chris Woodfield, Tom Murphy, Emma Whitaker, Sepp Corsavi and Johnny Bluer. And I remember I see lots and lots of those comments coming in from the uh, on the, the discussion thread from those guys so keeping it going. Um, so absolutely special thanks have to go to um, a, a small number of people that have been completely 100 and 110 percent. We now realize that we can have that. Katie Rhodes, our event manager. Alistair Watts has been absolutely outstanding in the technical support along with Katie, keeping things going. Um, and then two people who really need to be singled out, and particularly Naomi folks, who who's our marketing and events lead, who's just kept everything on track, uh, talked to all the speakers, developed the brand, and put everything into the system. This really wouldn't have happened happened without Naomi. And last but absolutely not least, uh, Paul Hardman, who who um, designed the whole thing, brought the whole organisational structure together, the speakers, the different teams, and all the rest of it. Um. I, I just wanted to say uh, a personal thing in terms of um, my thanks, because um, as, as I mentioned at the start, I'm moving on. I'm taking up a four-year secondment in Jordan for my sins in the next in the next few weeks. I'll be going out to Amman to start that, and so I'm finishing and pulling back really from the Sustainable Earth Institute as, as director. And on that context, I want to have special thanks to Paul Hardman, uh, really, who's been an absolute 
um, star over the last five years and just makes me look good, to be honest. And so he's uh, continuing uh, to, to drive things forward. Uh, I want to thank the Dean and uh, the VC and particularly Mark Anderson, head of school, for their support in uh, keeping the SEI alive and keeping faith with me all the way through that process. And, and also, I want, finally want to give thanks to uh, Will Blake. Will Blake is going to be taking over as director of the SEI. And I want to thank Will because he's got a project called Jali Ardi in, in, um, in East Africa. And although that wasn't an SEI project, that more than any other project I know that we're involved in captures the essence of what the Sustainable Earth Institute was all about, being interdisciplinary, participatory, et cetera. And so I absolutely know that the SEI is in, is in good hands and will uh, flourish. And it's just left for me to say, if you've enjoyed this event, our Low Carbon Devon project has a series of events coming up and you'll find more about those on the University Low Carbon Devon uh, webpage. But, um, but for me, it's a massive thanks to everyone. I hope you've enjoyed it. We've certainly enjoyed it. And, um, and, and see you next year, I guess. And maybe actually seeing you next year. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care.